Now, as you can see, the primary thing I'm going to uh, speak with you about today is the wave of anti-Asian violence that has swept the United States really for the last year and that unfortunately has uh, come to the fore in March and April, the awful shooting in the Atlanta suburbs where six of the eight people shot in a massage parlor were Asian American women, but also the videos that have been captured of, of random violence, the increased number of slurs, graffiti, spitting, it's awful, right? And, and, and uh, Amy, asked me to give this lecture on this topic today. As you may know, May is Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month and uh, Heritage Month, sorry. And 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 the the you know thing that we could be talking about is the many contributions that Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders have made to American culture, their diversity, their significance to our economy, our society, our politics. I will say just a little bit about that in the context of this lecture, but I'm really not the person to speak with you about that. I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert. I don't have the background. Uh, and, and so I will leave that to somebody else. But what I do feel like I can speak with you a little bit about and what it, Amy did request that I speak about is this wave of violence and putting it in the broader context of the, the changing racial dynamics in the contemporary United States. And, and, and so that is where I will focus today. Before I do that, I do want to notice, and, and, and uh, sometimes, right, and, and as was the case with today, we, we, we set the agenda long in advance, and, and, and then the news of the previous week turns out to be important. And, and so I just want to note very briefly some of the things happening in the world and the United States this week that I think are worthy of our attention even though they're not going to be the focus of this week's lecture. The first is that the coronavirus pandemic raged back, right? We had the, the, the worst week in the history of the pandemic in terms of cases reported globally. And this is primarily to do with what's happening in India and Latin America, especially South America, where just awful scenes of the complete collapse of, of, of the health infrastructure in the face of raging contagion. And, and, and it, it is a humanitarian nightmare, a, a, a real catastrophe. And not only that, it, it is also a threat even to the parts of the world that have done better at containing the pandemic and getting vaccinations out. And obviously there are issues of distributive justice to do with the availability of the vaccines. And, and there's an ongoing conversation. It's kind of on the back burners right now. I hope maybe it will get more attention about intellectual property patents on the vaccine and then the limited availability of the vaccine in many parts of the world. And I, I should really be saying plural, the vaccines, right, because there are, are many of them at this point. And the, the hope, the um, really both humanitarian and self-interested imperative that we get more vaccination, that we do more to assist countries that are struggling. Because as I've said to you before, the more the virus is in human populations. And, and, and there's more of it in the world today than there's been at any point since the outbreak a year and a quarter ago. Um, the, the more chance it has to replicate, the more chance it has to mutate, the greater the probability that one of those mutations will attenuate the efficacy of the vaccines. And, and, and so I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, 
trying to frighten you, but I am indicating that um, this is a, a dangerous scenario. And not only is it is in, in the US's interest in terms of being uh, a, a just actor on the global stage. And, and I, I, I do think that's not only a moral imperative, but also in our interest in terms of continuing to assert world leadership at a moment where our economic power is waning. We can find other forms of authority, but it's also in our narrow self-interest in terms of protecting ourselves from the, vac from the virus to make the vaccine as broadly available as possible. Now, second big thing that happened this week is that Biden gave his first address to Congress uh, on the event of his 100th day as the president. And this was a, a, a significant address. I think what is clear now in light of this address is that Joe Biden, who spent his career in politics primarily as a moderate, as somebody searching for bipartisan consensus, as somebody who in a sense came of age in the era of the Reagan revolution, the uh, era in which Bill Clinton famously declared the era of big government is dead, that, that Joe Biden now sees himself not just as a transitional, but as a transformational president. And that in particular, he wants to reorient the role of government in 21st century America, to, to make the government's role in the economy, the government's role in providing security and decency for average Americans, the government's role in spurring future economic growth by investing in the economy and the infrastructure, who sees government as having a major and important role to play in 21st century America. And so as you can see, and, and I will go into this in detail in future lectures, the programs that he outlined in his address last week total more than $4 trillion on top of a $1.9 trillion stimulus bill going uh, primarily to a very ambitious infrastructure plan. It is not being called a Green New Deal, but it incorporates many important aspects of the Green New Deal. And so it involves investment in energy and building and transportation, as well as jobs that would do a great deal to accomplish the goal of reducing American greenhouse emissions by 2050 to half of what they were at the beginning of the century. But it also contains a great deal of support for education and for children and family and elder care and expanding the Affordable Care Act tax credits, et cetera. And, and so what I, I think we need to recognize that in a sense, the center of the Democratic Party has shifted and has shifted uh, quite dramatically. There was a column in the New York Times that said maybe in a sense Bernie Sanders actually won the 2020 election. Not obviously that he got the nomination or is the president, but that the issues that he identified in his insurgent campaign in 2016 have become the mainstream issues for even a historically middle of the road Democrat like Joe Biden. By the way, I'll, I'll, I'll just mention this very quickly. We got jobs data and economic data last week also, which indicates that the economy is rebounding quite significantly. And, and I would just point out, right, that that is very different from what's happening in Europe and that the degree to which the United States has been simultaneously aggressive in getting vaccines out and in engaging in stimulus spending may indicate that this is the right economic path to be on, and that may give further leverage to Joe Biden in pursuing these bills. Now, one thing to notice immediately is that despite the ambition of these bills, the Democratic 
hold on power is razor thin, right? They've got a one person majority in the Senate when Kamala Harris comes in as president pro temp to break the tie, right? And, and so a lot of this is going to have to be done through reconciliation, a parliamentary maneuver that allows the Democrats to bypass the threat of filibuster. And so ultimately, the ability to accomplish this will depend on how the Senate parliamentarian rules. And that, right, is a, a technical arcane issue, but ultimately it may be decisive about which aspects of this plan get passed. And I will just conclude that little portion by, by noting that much of this stuff is very popular with the American electorate. And, and obviously it is fiercely resisted by Mitch McConnell and the Senate Republicans, by the House Republicans as well, uh, but they do seem to be out of step with their voters. And that may give Joe Biden a certain amount of leverage in getting some of this stuff passed. Third and finally, you, you may have seen yesterday that Republican controlled Florida legislature passed another restrictive voting bill. And, and so the, the uh, effort of the Republican Party to restrict voting access, which is what I spoke with you about last week, uh, for the 2022 elections and going into the emerging decade is, is now spreading, spreading in light of the rhetoric of voter fraud, the claim on the behalf of many Republican elected officials that Joe Biden did not legitimately win the 2020 presidential election, that it was only because of substantial fraud that he became president and, and that therefore they need to crack down on this fraud. Texas is next up, it appears, in terms of passing this kind of legislation. This increases the likelihood then that there will be a showdown between state Republican officials, right? The, 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 the states where the Republicans are in power that are passing this legislation and congressional Democrats who are passing legislation that does the exact opposite. And when I say they're um, passing legislation, the For the People Act, H.R. 1, has already passed the House of Representatives. It is on its way to the Senate. In the Senate, it has no chance of passing unless the filibuster rule is changed. Then I just want to point out, as I did last week, that it seems to me that um, the most likely cause of, 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 of the conservatives on this issue. Uh, Joe Manchin comes to mind as the most important of these, uh, is that Kristen Cinema from Arizona would be another. Uh, the, 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 the senators who are moderate Democratic senators who've said that they believe that filibuster is an important rule in preventing extremism and polarization, may have to really swallow hard on the question of voting rights when many states are restricting them and when it appears to be a effort to prevent rising demographic groups from gaining increased power, from preventing the Democrats from assembling a, a, a viable 21st century coalition, um, that this is really going to increase the pressure on cinema and mansion and the Democrats to reconsider the filibuster. So they're just a, a, a little bit about what we should be paying attention to in the last week of American politics now. Let me get into what's happening with Asian American politics in the United States. And, and actually, I think I want to start um, here. And, and I'll go back in a, in a, in a moment. And, and so I want to ask, start with, with a fairly obvious observation. Um, there's been a spike in anti-Asian 
violence in the United States. And, and um, I, I do have the, the data on that. Um, you can see it quite clearly. Um, and it's, it, it, it's quite striking when you put it in uh, historical context, right? Anti-Asian hate crimes were um, relatively rare in the United States in the previous five years. Of course, any hate crime is uh, uh, ab abominable and, 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 and we should always be sensitive to this and the data that's being collected is not particularly reliable. But what we seem to see is a dramatic rise in anti-Asian violence hate crimes that are not just right but Asians targeted for crime but Asians targeted because they are Asian or because the people who are committing the crime are motivated by animus similarly if we look at harassment and and, and this can be physical attacks verbal attacks or vandalism uh, over the last year, what we see is big surges in March of 2020 and March of 2021, but uh, much higher rates than is typically the case in the United States. And so the question is, is this all about the fact that on the one hand, the coronavirus originated in China? And on the other hand, Donald Trump repeatedly referred to the coronavirus as the China virus or Kung flu, right? And, and, and so here we see the graffiti of uh, an Asian American business, right? With Kung flu uh, written on the uh, window and then hope you die, right? And, and, and I, I wanna, observe that, that in a sense that there's an obvious correlation. The president of the United States with his bully pulpit, and, and Trump really put the bully in the pulpit of the president of the United States, uh, starts broadcasting uh, racist messages blaming China for the coronavirus pandemic. And in the context of a trade war in which Trump has sought to, and, and, and please note, right, you know, this is the, the, the key to Trump's political success. On the one hand, build a wall to keep Latino immigration out of the United States, and on the other hand, initiate a trade war with tariffs against China and suggest that the um, economic insecurity being experienced by Americans in the 21st century in a transition into a post-industrial information and service economy is primarily caused by outsiders. And, 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 and so in a sense, it's obvious and unsurprising that this would be occurring now. And in another sense, I want to say that it's a mistake to blame Donald Trump primarily or exclusively for this. And that is not to let him off the hook. Clearly, this is hateful, abysmal stuff that he is doing. But I think we need to view Trump as a clever political entrepreneur, someone who had a very strong intuitive sense of how to channel the anger and resentment of a significant portion of the American population and that he directed it recently against Asians, against the Chinese in particular, seeking to blame them for the coronavirus in order to distract from his administration's own mismanagement of it. But having said all that, that we met him halfway. And when I say we, I don't mean those of you listening to me right now, I mean the American people as a whole, and in particular important segments of it who feel threatened, 
who feel insecure, who see their privilege slipping away from them, and who are looking for a scapegoat, who are looking for somebody to blame. And so I, I, I want to drill down on that today. And, and I want to start by thinking about some of the, the, the literature on Asian Americans and the way in which perhaps it's changed and the way in which that might change the way we think about the current wave of anti-Asian violence. And so I'm gonna start with a, a, a diagram that's very influential. Uh, this is from Claire Jean Kim's work on the racial triangulation of Asian Americans. And what Kim suggested in this work is that Asian Americans were primarily viewed in comparison with white Americans and black Americans. And that this is the nature of racial stereotyping in general. It tends to be relational, right? That is to say, it doesn't just create a stereotype for this group, the out group, but it does it in contrast with the in group, right? With the group that is dominant and in a power to, uh, in the, that has the power to promulgate a stereotype and that in particular the content of the race racial stereotype of asian americans involved contrasting them both with whites and blacks right and and there's a whole literature on asians being the model minority right and then I'll, I'll say now a little bit more about that arun venikapal had an article on Indian Americans in the January issue of The Atlantic that I, I recommend to you and, and, and in a sense still fits this kind of literature that, that says Asian Americans were differentiated from African Americans by white Americans in an effort in a sense to say, look, recent immigrants and racial minorities can make it and do well in America. So African Americans should quit their griping and just emulate Asian Americans. And, and, and so to, to be specific about the content of this, what um, uh, Kim suggests is that there are two metrics of comparison here. One of them has to do with inferior or superior, and, 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 and that has to do with intelligence, work ethic, uh, morality, criminality, um, economic, uh, an entrepreneurial acumen, and, and that Asian Americans were treated as superior to African Americans in all those regards, perhaps not superior to white Americans, but at least an indication and, and an effort to say, look, white Americans are not racist against all uh, minority groups, and in fact, not racist at all. And, and on the other hand, right, there's a second dimension of comparison, which has to do with being foreign or inside or native, right? And, and, and in this regard, Asian Americans were treated as more foreign than African Americans and whites. And so this triangulation involved both praising and at the same time attaching a negative stereotype to Asian Americans. Now, I want to suggest there is something still to this, this idea that we're seeing again and again, right? People go, coming up to Asian Americans uh, on BART, on the subways and saying, go home, right? As if they don't belong here, as if they aren't citizens, as if they haven't been here for over a century, right? As long as many white American families have been here as well, right? So, so the, the stereotype still continues to operate, but are we right to think that Asian Americans have their own specific category that perhaps shelters them a little bit from some of the uh, kinds of racism that have been directed against African Americans in American history? And, and, and that's where I, I wanna drill down a little bit. Um, so uh, I, I want to just point one more thing out to you, and, and, and I just took this diagram, I could have taken a uh, hundred other diagrams uh, from a, a recent sociological study um, on trends in family income and segregation. And as you can see, the categories are 
black families, Hispanic families, all families, white families. And I think this is again, characteristic of much of the thinking about race in the United States up till the present, which is when we think of race as a uh, axis of inequality, of hierarchy and oppression, we tend to think of primarily a white black or a white Latino divide and not to think as much about Asian Americans. And again, the recent wave of violence, it may have a proximate cause and that proximate cause may be Trump motivating this violence through awful rhetoric that blames Asians for a global pandemic. But there's a deeper force at work. And I think that deeper force requires our attention if we're not going to view what happened in 2021 simply as, a, and I should say 2020, a blip caused by Trump. And, and, and one way to, to, to think about this is look, uh, the, the, the rate of violence actually, sorry, went up in 2021, despite the fact that Trump is no longer the president, is in fact um, banned from Twitter, has lost his platform for spreading this. And so uh, it seems to me that we, we might be detecting something deeper about the mutation of American racism, and that certainly deserves our attention. So I wanna start now with a, a diagram I know I've shared with you before. Uh, and, and this diagram indicates the share of the foreign born in the US population. And, and as you can see, right, uh, we are about to surpass the highest share of foreign born that we have recorded in American history going back to the beginning of the 20th century, and that it is likely to increase throughout uh, the uh, remainder of the 21st century, at least as far out as demographic, dem demographers are able to project, up to the point where we may have almost 20% of the population foreign born. Um, and, and then you add to this the fact that we are well on our way to being a society in which whites will lose their demographic majority, right? And, and, and the, the uh, change here is, is projected. It's, it's not certain. You know, one of the questions is, will uh, Hispanics start identifying as white? Might that change their share? But, but I, I just want you to, to notice here for a second that the reason that, that white Americans are declining in terms of their overall share of the population is not because African Americans are increasing. It is because the share of the population that's Hispanic American is increasing, but frankly, it's even more because the share of the population that is Asian American is increasing. And uh, when, when we drill down on this a little, and, and let me get to some other data for you for a moment, sorry, uh, right, the, the, the um, demographic, change, right, that is the, the most significant change in terms of proportionality is the increased immigration from Asia, right? And, and, and so um, Asians, if, if the demographic projections are correct, will surpass um, Latinos or Hispanics as the largest immigrant group in the country by um, I, I should say the largest share of immigrants coming to the country by 2050 around. And, 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 and please note that that's more or less the same time when America becomes a so-called majority minority society. And, and so uh, the, the demographic changes that are occurring are substantial and I'm going to return now to a diagram I've shown you before. These changes 
especially for a certain, certain segment of the white American electorate, seem to be very threatening. They are threatening the hegemony, the dominance of, of white Americans. And, and please note, I, I think this is extremely important in thinking about why in March of 2021 is there a wave of anti-Asian violence. On the one hand, right, after Barack Obama, a, a, a president who embraced the growing diversity racially speaking, of the United States. We got Donald Trump, a, a, a president who promised to make America great again by keeping people from South America, Latin America, out of the United States, building a wall, a beautiful wall on the southern border, right? And, and who uh, had a nostalgic view of the United States, uh, looking back to a period in which white, the white majority was in no way threatened, right? Going back to the middle of the 20th century when restrictions on immigration made us clearly a majority white society and who, um, in a sense, denied the legitimacy of the Obama presidency. The, that, that's the birther movement, right? And, and so the fact that Donald Trump was only a one-term president, the fact that he got replaced by Joe Biden, who chose Kamala Harris, a woman who was jointly African-American and, oh, I, I should say jointly of African and Asian descent, right? Uh, to be his vice president, who really only became president in terms of the primaries, especially because of African-American support, further indicated in a sense that the revanchist effort, the effort to restore, if you will, white privilege and white power had failed, um, and that America was continuing to diversify, and that its more diverse population was continuing to assert its power. And, and I'm suggesting, using this diagram, which I've shared with you before, that in these circumstances, in circumstances of rapid demographic change, that threaten the hitherto dominant group in our society, that many people, in a sense, change their political orientation. And when I say many people, I'm speaking of what the very important political psychologist, Karen Stenner, calls those with an authoritarian personality. And I've pointed out to you that she developed her test for determining who has an authoritarian personality by looking at attitudes to child rearing, not by looking at political attitudes, right? But do you want your children just to do what you tell them to do, right? That would simplify it, but to, to follow your orders as opposed to thinking for themselves, being curious and critical. And if you do, then you probably have an authoritarian personality and authoritarian personalities become politically relevant in moments of normative threat, in moments of rapid cultural, social, demographic change, when people who like things staying as they are, say, staying stable, having norms and expectations, ethics and morality, institutions that are continuous over time, that don't change, when they experience rapid change, they ask for leaders who prevent that change, who close the society to the forces of change. And that comes to replace the left-right ideological spectrum that we tend to think about. And please note that Donald Trump was a little bit hard to categorize on the left-right ideological spectrum, but that when Stenner and others used an authoritarian spectrum instead, are you cosmopolitan and open to change or more authoritarian and wanting a leader who's going to prevent change, it became very easy to predict Trump's support and to analyze Trump politically. He's not traditionally left right, but he is very much in the authoritarian mold. And, and so the fact that we lost 
Trump when I say we lost, you know, good riddance to bad rubbish, I'm sure many of us feel. But the fact that Trump lost in 2020 might have made those who had looked to him as a figure who would close or slow the rate of demographic change and restore a sense of continuity, normality, stability might have made them all the more threatened. You add to that a major recession and a pandemic, and you may begin to feel uh, that, that things really are falling apart if you have that kind of authoritarian personality. Let me, before I go into this, uh, share a couple quotes with you. And, and I do think, and, and I'll produce some evidence as, as we go along, that one of the things that's particularly disturbing and distressing about contemporary American politics is the degree to which partisan polarization is overlapping with racial polarization. The uh, Democratic Party no longer gets a majority of the white vote. The Republican Party gets a very small share of the vote of African Americans, Latinos, and Asians. And having said all of that, the Republican Party voter seems to indicate a great deal of hostility to uh, immigration, to uh, policies, to rectify America's history of racial injustice. And so Ezra Klein, in what I think is a very good book that, that I'll talk with you about later this month, uh, Why We're So Polarized, says the following. There is nothing that makes us identify with our groups so strongly as the feeling that the power we took for granted may be, soon be lost or the injustices we've long borne may soon be rectified. And, and so we're seeing a greater salience of race in American politics, in part precisely because the racial demographics of our society are changing quickly and because the white majority feels increasingly threatened, or at least a significant portion of it does, by these developments. I also went back to James Baldwin from his mid-1970s 70 work, mid -1970s work, The Devil Finds Work, for another good quote, an identity is questioned only when it is menaced, as when the mighty begin to fall or when the wretched begin to rise or when the stranger enters the gate, never thereafter to be a stranger, the stranger's presence making you the stranger, less to the stranger, than to yourself. And, and please remember, right, uh, that uh, diagram, I'll, I'll, I'll put it back up very quickly, from, uh, I'm sorry, there it is, from uh, uh, Claire Jean Kim, right, Asian Americans have been categorized as being female for so long. And now we have an Asian American vice president, increasing Asian American power. So does this mean that the stranger is now inside the gates and that many of us are feeling threatened? Again, I think this is important in understanding Asian American racism, racism against Asian Americans in the 21st century. Final piece of the puzzle here in terms of the categories of social scientific analysis that I think are relevant. Uh, I, I spoke with you last summer uh, about Ryan Enos's work. And, and I think, again, this is a, a very important book. He's a professor of political science at Harvard University. Um, and he's the author of The Space Between Us, as well as dozens of articles. He's, he's, he's a relatively young scholar, but he's prolifically productive. Uh, and he sets up this model of social impact in thinking about the way social psychology, geography, and demography interact. Um, and, and so on the one hand, he suggests that um, a group category, if it becomes more salient, if it becomes more readily available, uh, is uh, likely going to be the target for group-based biased 
against outgroups. And, and I've already shown you that the Asian American share of the overall American population is growing rapidly. One of the examples that, that uh, Enos uses is actually of Laotians and, and the indication if there's a very small population from Laos, you're probably not going to develop stereotypes about people from Laos. But as the percentage of American who are of Chinese or Japanese or Indian or Pakistani or Malaysian descent increases, it becomes easier for us to develop stereotypes. Uh, the salience of a social group category is determined by both its availability and its comparative fit. So, right, uh, the size of the group helps to determine its availability. Uh, its fit depends on whether or not it works, right? If, if, if you've got a stereotype that seems to never actually be realized by the people you apply it to, then it is difficult to sustain that stereotype. And one of the things that Enos points out is the way in which segregation makes it easier to think of the category as having a fit to it. Uh, the size and proximity of a social outgroup also affects the availability of the category. And uh, the, the fact of the matter is that Asian American immigration is concentrated. Basically, 50% of, Amer of Asian Americans live in the Western United States. Um, and, and the fact that it is geographically concentrated and, and in specific cities and then in specific neighborhoods in specific cities is a kind of standard immigration pattern. You tend to go to places where people from your home country have already gone, where you will have a network of support, where there may be some economic opportunities, where there may be people who speak your language, but that then increases the uh, comparative fit of the category as segregation makes us think of them as all belonging together, as all being the same. And that accentuates both the in-group similarity and the out-group difference, the groupishness of groups. And, and I do believe in a sense that um, for at least important periods of American history, Asian Americans may have escaped some of this precisely because they were not a sizable enough group. But now that their size and the population is growing, um, this is an increasing problem. Now, in thinking again about white Americans, and, and, and I wanna be clear, not all anti-Asian violence is done by white Americans, but I think the pr vast preponderance of it is, and at the same time, um, the fact that a political party, the Republican party seems to be mobilizing aspects of this. And, and, and again, I want to be careful, right? There was an anti-Asian violence bill that passed the Senate a couple weeks ago, and it passed with near unanimous support from both Republicans and Democrats. It's not like Republicans are in favor of anti-Asian violence, but to the extent that Trump continues to have significant power within the party, that he continues to blame China for the coronavirus pandemic and to use language that is inflammatory in referring to it, then it does become a partisan issue. And, and, and what we see here, right, and, and I think this is, is really quite striking, right, what group uh, faces a great deal or a lot of discrimination, right? African Americans, three quarters of Democrats believe that, less than 50% of Republicans, that's a 32 point gap. Now, please note, again, this is an indication of the way in which we failed to pay attention to this. Asians are not even on this list. But when we come down to men and whites, right? Uh, what we see is that for Republicans, fully a quarter of Republicans believe that whites are subject to a great deal or a lot 
or of racial discrimination. Again, a very big gap with Democrats, although white Democrats, 10% of them also believe this. Um, and finally, when, in terms of these general racial attitudes, when we look at immigration, and, and again, I think the polarization here, white liberals used to think that immigration was a critically important issue. And, and, and right, that includes a critical threat, right? Almost to the same degree that white moderates and white conservatives did. But over the course of the last 20 plus years, this has absolutely fallen off a cliff, right? It's decreased dramatically. And those who think it's not important or not critical um, have increased dramatically. But when we look at white conservatives, after a kind of similar movement in the, the 1990s, when we get back to 2016, it's up almost as high as it was in 1994. All right, so that's that's the the the, the general context here, and and I, I I want to be clear. It seems to me that American politics is increasingly polarized, increase increasingly zero sum, increasingly characterized by negative partisanship, by discrimination against the outgroup, by fear, anger, and anxiety directed at the representatives of the other party and that this has an increasingly racial dimension and that it's likely that it's not just going to be directed against African Americans and Latinos, but increasingly directed against Asian Americans as well. That's the, the, the thesis of today's lecture. Let me now give you a little bit more information about the demographics of Asian Americans. And, and as I've already indicated, they are perhaps the largest or the most rapidly growing immigrant group to the United States today. And after having been right, a negligible portion of the immigrants to the United States in the middle of the 1960s when racist immigration law kept them out of the country, they have grown rapidly as soon as that law was changed and are now becoming the largest immigrant group to the United States, at least projected to become that by the middle of the century. Um, just to be clear, Asian Americans actually acquire English very thoroughly, right? Which is to say, of all of them, 72% are proficient uh, and uh, thir uh, fully a third speak only English. Of those who are born in the United States, 95% are fully proficient. Those who are foreign born and emigrate to the United States, 57% are proficient in English. And, 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 and so that's just one metric of assimilation, but clearly Asian Americans are uh, for the most part doing very well at acquiring English and acquiring uh, educational opportunity in general. But having said that, I, I think it's important to recognize that this is a very big demographic category, right? This includes people from China and Japan who may have been in this country for over a hundred years, and people from Vietnam and Laos who may have been here since the Vietnam War or the American campaign in Southeast Asia, and people from Pakistan and India who are relatively recent immigrants. And, and, and part of the way that we see this is in terms of the spread of income. Right, that, that you've got um, Asian Americans in general doing reasonably well, in fact, above average in terms of median annual household income, but uh, you have a big disparity between say Indian and Burmese uh, income in the United States. And I, I, I would point out to you that this has a lot to do with who is immigrating. Right? Are they people who are 
well-educated and professional, high cultural capital in their own society and coming here to take advantage of that cultural capital? Or are they relatively poor in their own society coming without education, without resources to start entrepreneurial ventures, without strong networks to assist them in finding opportunity in the society. This is the standard immigrant story, but being played out with new categories. Um, the uh, next and, and really kind of final thing I, I want, want to note today is that there are uh, important voting trends emerging. And so what we see in general is that six in 10 Asians are eligible to vote in the most recent elections, either because they are naturalized or US born. Um, and some of those, actually a significant portion of those who are not eligible to vote are only not eligible to vote because they are not yet 18. And that if, if we look um, at the, share of the overall electorate, right? Asian Americans are still relatively small. It depends on the state, 5% roughly nationally. Uh, but the uh, growth rate of, of the number of citizens just from 2000 to 2020, they have more than doubled in terms of their share of the American electorate. And please note that many um, elections are decided by less than 4% of the vote, right? And, and so there is the potential for Asian Americans to be a decisive influence in the United States. And, and this is what I wanted to conclude with today. There's a clear partisan lean in Asian American voting patterns. And you can see uh, it wasn't always that way, right? In, in, in the late 1990s, um, Asian Americans voted for Republicans and Democrats at almost equal uh, rates. Uh, but beginning uh, in the early 2000s, the divide opened up and we're now to the point where 72%, three quarters of Asian Americans vote Democratic, 17%, less than a fifth vote um, Republican. And, and that's a larger gap than you see with Latinos. It is in fact much closer to the voting patterns of African-Americans, was not always that way. Please note, of course, that there's a slight bias in terms of, I should say a slight partisan lead in terms of white Americans for the Republican party. Um, and, and so um, this overlap between racial polarization and partisan polarization is something I'm going to be speaking with you about in coming lectures. Um, when I talk about parties and democracy more generally, which is what I'll be doing for the remainder of the month, but I did want to spend a little bit of time speaking with you about this today. So uh, any thoughts, questions, comments? Who wants to start us out? John, go ahead. Uh, it's a small point, but I was interested in that chart you had about uh, the uh, attitudes of various political groups toward immigration, where back, I wrote this down, but probably incorrectly, back in the uh, 1960s, no, the, uh, back in the 1960s, 72% or something, there we go. 65% of white liberals were thought that immigration was a serious critical problem. Mm -hmm. Well, the plunge is certainly interesting, but why was it so high back then? Uh, and it's, um, and uh, of course, maybe liberals got a lot less racist but I think the, the, the difference is the changing agenda of American politics when e economics used to be foremost for liberals, and now it's whatever you call it, identity or whatnot. And when you're thinking largely in terms of economics from the point of view of progressive, you think of the downward pressure on, on wage rates uh, presented by immigrants coming in and taking all the, the, the lower jobs. I know perfectly well, I was quite opposed to immigration. I mean, I was one of those people back uh, 
a while ago, maybe not as late as 94, uh, for exactly that reason. It, it, it was the certainly the AFL-CIO line and, uh, and that of most uh, uh, left-wing Democrats. So it's more a matter of the changing agenda of politics, I think, than of any ma major attitudinal change on the part of uh, uh, attitudes toward immigrants as people on the part of uh, liberals. Yeah, interesting. And, and, and I will just point out to you, that in an interview in 2016, um, Bernie Sanders sounded almost like Donald Trump when asked about immigration, right? And, and he was still towing the old AFL-CIO line, which is to, is to say that immigration is bad for wages for American workers. And there is some evidence to that effect, right? The social science evidence is, is, is really hard to uh, get this right. It does appear that it's sector specific. So for instance, in construction or certain service sectors, or maybe even in big tech work, that, that uh, having a lot of immigrants draws, br brings wages down for nations, which, which is what Bernie said in answering a, a question in an interview. Um, so um, yes, that attitude may persist. And, and, and then I, I like where you're, you're going with this, John, which is to say that this doesn't necessarily mean that white liberals all of a sudden fell in love with immigrants so much as that they changed their orientation about what matters to them in politics, that being a liberal in 2021 means embracing diversity, and that means you can't be anti-immigrant even if you still remain pro-labor, right? Uh, but I, I, I wanna say more about that for a second, and if, if you go back to that chart, which I won't do at the moment, one of the things you'll see is an, a, a big uptick, let me go back to it so, so that I can show you what I'm talking about, uh, a, a big uptick in white conservative hostility to immigration from 2014 to 2016, right? And, and, and this is the Trump effect. And what I would add is that partisanship in the United States has become primarily negative. And so if the other side is anti-immigrant, it actually drives us to be more friendly to immigration, right? Now, the, the, the third and final layer to this is the political psychology layer, which is, is to say, where do white liberals live, right? They, they, they live in the San Francisco Bay Area. They live in New York City. And, and there's uh, going uh, back to uh, Gregory Alport's uh, very important work in uh, the psychology of prejudice from the 1960s, where he developed the so-called contact hypothesis. It's, it, it's very hard to have negative attitudes about a group that you have a lot of positive contact and interaction with, right? And, and so, um, you know, if, if, if you live in the San Francisco Bay Area, you have neighbors who are Asian Americans. You, you probably chit chat with them in the driveway at the end of the day, makes it a lot harder to be stereotyped against them, right? And more generally, if liberal Americans are increasingly also of an open, anti-authoritarian, cosmopolitan, psychological type, right? Then it's hard not to see diversity as constructive, right? And, 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 and to welcome the change that it brings. If conservative Americans are increasingly overlapping with people who have a more authoritarian psychological disposition, and please note that doesn't always make them support authoritarian leaders. It's only in periods of rapid change that they see as normatively threatening. And we are in a moment of rapid demographic and rapid economic and rapid cultural and rapid technological change, right? It's almost a perfect storm. If you're someone who fears change, then maybe you're scared of all of this. And maybe that in part explains the uptick 
in anti-immigration sentiment in the United States in over the last five years. All right, thank you, John. Good, 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 good drilling down on one of those pieces of data. Anybody else? I think I hear another voice. Yes, Rocky wants to speak. Please go right ahead. Good. I think what is happening in the uh, kind of violence that is being practiced against the Asian American, um, of, of course, the lumpen are blaming the Asians for the COVID. Um, they are, they're the hopeless ones and they're easily persuaded uh, to find an outlet for their violence. But something more subtle occurs. Let's look at the situation at Lowell High School where there was such, where there is still a genuine attempt um, to give the the black and brown children a, a greater a bigger opportunity uh, to experience the wonderful education that they supposedly got at at Lowell High School, and 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 there was such a thing. Not only were there good teachers, but the kids were so smart. You had to be good to keep up with them. And the point is, as far back as the 60s, not today, but the 60s, Lowell High School was half Chinese. When I say half Chinese, there were other Asian groups, but the Asians um, moved up from Lowell to become doctors, scientists, so there is a certain amount of resentment, the kind of resentment that still exists against the Jewish population. It has, it's hidden now, it's subsided, but there's also, you can tell, or they're too smart. And there's this kind of, uh, I don't want to call it envy, it's like, you want your kids to be as smart as the next one. Not too smart, but, and you want the same opportunities. Well, it shows in what has happened at Lowell High School. I think that the San Francisco community is basically a liberal community and a fair community, and they will make adjustments, but it has been hard for the San Francisco Unified School District. They ain't so unified anymore, that's all. Yeah, no, it hasn't been a good period for the San Francisco Unified School District, especially for its leadership, right? Uh, and, and look, the same thing is happening in New York, the so-called selective or test-based entrance yes. exam schools. Uh, they're, they're completely reworking their admission criteria because they have become dominantly Asian and actually have been for quite a while. And at the same time, uh, certainly don't have the demographic diversity characteristic of New York City. Very few African Americans and Latinos in Stuyvesant and Bronx, et cetera. And, 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 and so, yes, the, the, but, but I, I want to return to, to what you said at the very beginning, Flossie, and, 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 and I, I do think, you know, that there are dimensions, Freire used to call this horizontal violence, right, where, where the, an immigrant turns against an immigrant, right, because they're competing for scarce goods, um, and, and, and there's some of that going on, but you said at the very beginning, right, the, the, the lumpen turn against Asian Americans, uh, in part because of uh, what Trump did with the rhetoric around the coronavirus. And, and I guess I, I, I want to make sure that what I tried to argue in the lecture today isn't lost on you. And, and, and that is that this may be not just a product of Trump and that Trump may be here as elsewhere more a symptom than a cause of the disease. And that, that what is happening is that Asian Americans are becoming a large enough proportion of the American population to become 
the targets of sustained and systemic racism. And so the, the, the kinds of violence that we're seeing against Asian Americans, and I wanna be careful about this, right? It is dwarfed by the violence that you see against African Americans. And, and it's important to, to, to note that, right? In, in the aftermath of the Derek Chauvin verdict, we, we can have the bandwidth to pay attention to two different kinds of racism without assimilating one to the other or indicating that one is more important than the other. But in terms of sheer numbers, uh, the violence against African American, the hate crimes against African Americans is a more substantial problem than hate crimes. Oh my God, hate that crimes. has not been lost on me, I assure you. Oh, I'm sure it's not, Flossie, but, but my, my claim is nevertheless that the, the, the rise in violence against Asian Americans may not just be caused by Trump and the coronavirus. It may be because, and in, in, in the, the diagrams, let me return to this, that, that I shared with you about the transformation of the racial demographics in the United States. If you look at this, by the time we get to the second half of this century, there will be more Asian Americans than there are African Americans in the United States. And, and I just think that's a, a sobering thing to digest. And oh. if um, someone like Ryan Enos is right, that as a group becomes larger, it becomes more salient in our minds, it becomes easier to construct negative stereotypes against them, to treat them like an outgroup. We need to be aware that, that this may be a growing problem even after, let us hope, the coronavirus is in our rear view mirror, at least as a pandemic, it's more like the flu, something that troubles us, but that doesn't shut us down. Asian American immigration will be with us for the remainder of the 21st century, as will a larger portion of the population being Asian American. And that, when you can go ahead. It's not necessarily Chinese, it's Asia now. Yeah, and, and that's one of the tricky things about this, right? If it's Chinese, it's Japanese, it's Burmese, it's Vietnamese. And, 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 and uh, up until that point, in Burmese is, 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 is tricky because Bur the Burmese may be hard to assimilate to the Chinese or the Japanese, but even harder, are the Indians and the Pakistani, right? The, 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 and, 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 and so can we, will we construct a coherent stereotype about a group that is so internally different, diverse, heterogeneous, right? Or not, it's, it's not clear to me, but I think we need to be thinking about the fact that Asian Americans who have up until this point been a relatively small portion of the population, are growing and may become more important to the overall racial dynamics of American society. Thank you for that, dear. Yeah, thank, thank you, Flossie, as always. Any, anybody else with a comment or a thought for today? Gonna wish you a very nice weekend and I'll look forward to seeing you all next week. Take care of yourselves and good talking with you as always. Bye-bye, guys.